yeah, next up is serial jobs, which can be found here on the schedule. So I will go ahead and open it. So Seema, what's a serial job and why? Yeah, so so like we already said that like uh, a couple times with different wordings, like sometimes you don't want to be there sitting in front of your um, like computer typing commands. Like that becomes repetitive, repetitive uh, very easily and, and, and not efficient. And you don't get the best out of like, if you start to have like million terminals open, you like, if you feel like a main character in a cheesy hacker movie or something like that, you know that something there must be a better way of doing it like they don't show it in the movies but in reality if you want to run commands you usually want to write them as scripts yeah so uh, similarly to if you write your code as a script like you have a python script matlab script julia script whatever com uh, language you're going to be using uh, there is a scripting language for command line and like you can write commands as, as this kind of a script mm -hmm. so a bunch of things that you want to run uh, like basically what you would type in the command line you can write them into a file and then run that mm -hmm. and there's also like you can you can do that in any system like that that you can run these kinds of scripts you can write these that you can run in any kind of system but there's additionally slurm scripts which is basically like uh, it's it's the same as a normal like script for this command line, but you also tell the queue to do do it in some other place. Basically, you tell the queue manager to take over and run these commands. So instead yeah. of like running the script file where you are currently sitting uh, or where your command terminal is, you tell the queue manager to take over and run this in a place that the queue manager thinks fits the script. And the queue manager determines it based on the requirement that you have specified. Yeah. So in the example script that uh, Richard show, is showing in the stream, we have a, a sim very simple script. So we, we at the first line, we have a, like the so-called interpreter. So what program is used to run the script? And usually it's going to be this bash. So you can just copy paste the same, same thing for every script that you're going to be using. There's advanced options, but let's not delve into too many details. So the first line just is as it is, is this so-called she bang that tells that, okay, run this with that command line. And next mm -hmm. few lines are then these S batch comments. And these are basically similarly that you gave like this, uh, you gave these uh, flags to the S run command. These comments are written in completely the same way. You have the same syntax here, but you just preface it with this hashtag and this S batch, and that syntax needs to be this exact way. So you need to have this hashtag and capital S batch all the way through, and then a space, and then some argument. And this, uh, this argument is then read by the queue manager that determines, like it read, reads these comments as this, uh, kind of requirements for the for the job mm -hmm. and it determines the requirements from these comments and then it it takes over basically you give the queue manager the script and the queue manager will read okay this script needs these kind of resources it finds the place for the resources and then it executes the script so basically it's like instead of running the commands the way you are currently are uh, you defer the execution later on to a proper place where the script can be run. Uh, yeah. So, And this so is why is, we consider yeah. shell one of these fundamental things for computing, because you need to be able to make scripts that are complicated enough to do what you need. Like, for example, CMO's array jobs. By knowing a little bit of shell, he was able to run something much more easily than doing it 10 times yourself. Yeah. So the command line is basically this kind of like a, like a wrapper of basically like, if you think like, if you are using 
Windows or Mac or, or whatever, you might have used these kinds of like also these uh, tools that basically automate, let's say, clicks or something on your mouse. Uh, this is basically a similar kind of thing that you basically tell, okay, type these commands basically for me, for the computer. And the computer will basically type these commands and it will run the, the exact same lines. And this makes it important that you like the script should represent what you should, what you would write interactively. And, and it will run those and then it will, it will do the things that you want to do. And it will run them in the system based on the requirements that you have. Yeah. So should we, should we do some live samples? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Uh, I think we've discussed this introduction. So let's go to our first batch script. Uh, here I am. So I'm in my work directory. What should we call our working space here? Um, dar... hmm. So Richard is now creating a directory uh, called kickstart uh, 2022, and he's going into di that directory via the CD command. Yeah. So so now and now with the PWD command, he's listing his current place in the system. Yeah. So if you think about like a, if you have like a, a process explorer or like resource explorer or something like that in in mm -hmm. a finder or whatever in Mac, uh, if you go to a certain folder, basically the commands will be executed in that folder now. Yeah. Relative to that folder. So let's use a simple like command line editor like nano to create our script. Yeah. Uh, so nano is this kind of a, like a minimal editor which has help, helpful hints at the bottom of the of the screen so that you can you know how to use it. Uh, and let's write this hello dot sh. Mm -hmm. And again like we said before it can be really useful to be able to edit some files quickly on the other computer yes and the sh like the uh, the ending sh it's it's just a shell script so it's it stands for shell and it's standard to be like sh it can be other stuff as well but usually it's standard to be like sh so that people recognize that okay this is a script that yeah. needs to be executed there's an interesting question in HackMD. Why is the dash L option needed? So here it doesn't have bin bash dash L. Mm. Mm. So yeah, this is a, a good question. It's a bit on the technical side, but it's it's a very good question. So the dash L option makes it so that like it it performs the shell performs as if if it would be an interactive session it will load all of the login uh, scripts that you would load whenever like it's certain this the certain profile files and stuff stuff like that are not loaded if you do not have the l option there it can be also detrimental if you have specified some uh, profile options for yourself that you didn't want to be loaded it <laughs> might load them uh, automatically yeah but but basically, it's like with the dash L, you make it extra certain that it it be her, performs as a like a, as an interactive terminal would. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've done this, and now let's see. Is there anything else? This is describing how to run it. So let's see. So I yeah. save it, and luckily Nano uh, tells me. Oh. Yeah. Let's quickly go through uh, what mm -hmm. we have in the script inside the script here. So mm -hmm. what we have is an s run command within the script mm. and and this means that well let let's run it and then then okay. discuss the maybe first yeah. yeah so nano tells me how to exit this yeah. caret sign means control so control x and i do yes to save and enter to say to write the same thing i will do ls to verify that yes it's there so we run with s batch yes, yes. so Many those people who have already done, written scripts, you might be familiar with like dot slash or whatever to or bash script or something, and that's that's basically to say that okay, I want to run this script right now. Like, but we don't want to do that. We want to run it through the queue, so we need to mm -hmm. give the script mm -hmm. to the queue manager, and you don't need to specify any that dot 
uh, stuff. Yeah. You just give you just give it so, the S batch and yeah. the. So this is what CMO said. So this would execute yeah. it directly. This would also execute mm. it directly, except it wouldn't execute it asynchronously. It would try to run it right here and right now. Yeah. So we so, want so, to do S batch. Yeah. So so just to uh, like a recap, if if you want to submit it to the queue, S run, S batch. S batch is is to uh, for scripts, but S run is to commands. So now we mm -hmm. see that there's like this output that uh, Richard got that submitted batch job and then a number. Mm -hmm. So each batch job, similarly to the S run command that you run, it gets a number that you can identify and mm -hmm. look it up later on. Yeah. In like like I mentioned uh, also <laughs> previously, in other clusters you might need to specify, for example, account statements mm -hmm. in the S batch mm -hmm. comments. Uh, or partition statements or similar kind of stuff in order to get the script to run. So whatever commands you would give to the S run command to run, you yeah. uh, can give to S batch command and it will run. Yeah. Okay. Should I try storm Q to see? Yes. It will probably show nothing because it's already finished. So then what's next? Uh, let's uh, type LS to see what oh, happened. Okay. Like, because like, mm -hmm. um, like here yeah. we see the so, new file. Yeah, so so you notice that the, we didn't get any output on the terminal when we run the script, and that's because mm -hmm. like of the non-interactive nature of the thing. We could have like let the script run and just go for a coffee break or whatever, and it would still be running asynchronously in the queue. Like like mm. it didn't need the terminal anymore to run once we hit the s batch script name uh, button once we pressed enter and we saw the job submitted we no longer need to like worry about it's it's now running somewhere uh, and that that means that the output is also not produced into the terminal so where does the output go the output goes into a file so we get our normal like output this print statements we get into this output file and in the script we specify the name for the output file to be this hello.out. So if we use for example cat uh, or catenate or should oh, we use cat less? Cat is nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, more cats. Uh, yeah. Actually, yeah, so let's say you need to look at the contents of a file. You could copy it to your computer, which is slow and annoying. Yeah. You can use less to open it. And then you sort of can scroll through it, or uh, you can use cat. Yeah, to, to quit less, you press Q. Mm -hmm. Just for those who typed less, uh, hello out and are stuck. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. There we go. Yeah. Cat uh, will basically catenate whatever <laughs> is in a file, or uh, like you can give it a, even a binary file, and that will mess up your terminal. So don't try to yeah. catenate like a binary <laughs> file yeah. or an image or something like that, it will print you garbage. Mm -hmm. But if you have this output file, it's easy to like use cat to check what the file contents were. So now you see that the output that like the, co the command produced ended up in this uh, output file. Mm -hmm. And now you see that here that we ha have a hello, uh, dark star one, you are on node, time is something like that, but that wasn't written in the script itself. Like that, that uh, text wasn't in the script itself. So if you compare it to the script, we in the script we have these uh, dollar sign things ha hanging around instead of like, uh, uh, instead of these texts. So what these dollar sign things are, they are environment variables. So this is uh, again, a shell or command line thing. So there are various of these environment variables that you can specify. And here we basically evaluate the script only when it's running. We run the script when it's running uh, in the node, in the compute node. So then when it's running, it will look up the user environment variable. So the username, it will check the host name variable, uh, which is the CSL 47 in this case. And then at the end, it will 
uh, run this command in this sub command. So uh, it's it's bit obfuscated because it's yeah. uh, like uh, command line thing. But you yeah, have these to are think like that more. These are all like standard shell tricks, so you don't yeah. need to know them to do basic work. But once you know them, you can do a lot of mm. cool stuff. Yeah, but the important thing to gather from this is that this could be anything. Like you could have anything running, what any kind of commands running here, as long as they can be run from the command line. So this is why it's very, very important to usually write your programs in a way that you can run them from the command line, because once you're able to run them from the command line, you can plug that command into the script and you just specify these uh, environment uh, or these variables at the, or these comments at the top of the script to specify what kind of resources you want and then it will be run uh, remotely, basically, on the compute node. So uh, it can be whatever, like choose your own adventure here after these comments. So you can have, you can run Python, you can run MATLAB, you can run R, you can run uh, MPI programs, you can run GPU, pro GPU using programs, whatever. Like you can have, as long as your program can be run from the command line, it's good to go. Yeah. Okay, so hmm. what's next? Is that basically most of what we need to say? So setting resource parameters we've talked about and with what you know in interactive jobs and what we've said already, it should be clear how to set these. Um, should we? Should we run one job that doesn't finish? Uh, finish. Mm. Oh, actually, I think that's one of the exercises. Maybe. So that's also with our grace period. It might take a little bit too long before it gets killed. Anyway, yeah. but yeah, so you can set the different resource parameters. The interactive page gives a full list of them, but it's exactly mm. the same between the two. Monitoring your I jobs think... is actually what we'll talk about next. So. We'll tell, we'll summarize some of the things we've said, like slurm history and so on. You can cancel mm. jobs. Partitions is something that we don't talk about much, but that's because it's not really, well, at least on Triton, we automatically detect partition. So, what was, yes. Simo, what was your analogy or metaphor for partitions? So, partitions are basically like, if you think about the restaurant and you have like uh, tables inside the restaurant, tables outside of the restaurant, mm. and you in some clusters, like in a, in in Triton, you basically you get the table that fits your group best. Uh, it, it might be inside or it might be outside. It might be mm -hmm. uh, next next to a like a cubicle. It might be open table. Like it, you might have different kinds of tables. But in some, you can usually specify that, okay, I want this to be outside. It doesn't necessarily help you. <laughs> you eat the food all the same outside than inside. But in some clusters, uh, if you need, or in some special cases, uh, you want to specify like the partition. Uh, for example, in CSC, you need to specify which partition you want to run the job. And that's basically analogous to telling the queue, like the waiter that, okay, I want to eat at the outside table. And then you, the, the queue manager will notice that, okay, I will limit my search for possible places where this mm -hmm. job can run to the outside yeah. tables. So like, that is how it goes. Like, yeah. So on some clusters, it matters and you need to actually select, like, are you going to something for small jobs or big jobs or so on? On Triton, this is automatically detected. But you can learn more about this by reading the information on your particular yeah. cluster. Yeah, in, in many, many, for example, uh, again, the CSC, like many like huge jobs are allocated into their own queue because they want to be able to fit like these huge jobs and having lots of small jobs with the huge jobs might make it harder for the huge jobs to fit. Mm -hmm. So it's easier to like, like you basically have a one big dining hall, hall that's reservable for big parties. Mm -hmm. And then you have lots mm -hmm. of small tables in a nearby room that have small tables for like few parties of few people only. Yeah. And they won't give like the whole dining row, hall for only two people. So, yeah. so basically that kind of thing uh, is possible. 
yeah. but it's nothing complicated. You just then specify the partition that you want with this dash dash partition and the name of yeah. the partition. Yeah. Well, finally, if you look at our reference page or right below, you can see some reference on all of the different commands and all the different storm options, but we don't need to discuss them anymore now. So we've got exercises. Mm -hmm. How should we do this? It's 24 past the hour. Uh, should we give 20 minutes or maybe 30 minutes for these exercises and then go on? That would go a little bit over the schedule, but I think we're answering where- Yeah, I, I think, yeah. and this is like the crux of the whole thing. Like this is, this is probably the most important lesson of the whole course. <laughs> like if you know yeah. how to run serial jobs, you're good to go to run uh like you the rest is just like uh spring like this is the main cake and the rest is just like uh different uh, kinds of mm -hmm. uh, well different kinds of sprinkles on top of it so if you know how to run serial jobs you're already really uh really good mm -hmm. to go so, so we should let's... give 30 minutes yeah let's do something like that yeah okay so and yeah, so uh, what uh, we quick... do here, it's like, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah go, go right ahead. Oh. Yeah. So during the exercises, there's one which is basically doing what we've done above, checking things. Then you try submitting and canceling it, things like looking at the output. And then um, some more, and these are quite, well, they're not very advanced, but things that you don't need to know in order to use the cluster. So if you have extra time, you can think about them, but really don't worry about them at all. And instead explore and play with everything we've been doing. Yeah, and I'll also mention that after the course, if you still feel unsure about the, uh, like using the command line, I highly recommend checking our, our bash course material on the command line usage or various other command line uh, material, CSC has good one as well, Code Refinery has good one, like any material that makes you feel more at home with using the command line. The Slurm thing is just a little like thing on top of it, which is these, these pa es resource parameters and the sbatch command. It's nothing fancy, but, but getting accustomed to the command line is very important. And I also highly, like even if the the example here looked very easy. It's a good idea to write the scripts by hand, not simply copy paste them, because then you make the mistakes of like typo, making a typo of a of a comment or something like that. It's very common to like think that like uh, it happens to everybody that you think that you know what the syntax is, and then you write it out of memory and it's wrong. <laughs> and you have to type it like few times these uh, serial job files in order to get it mm -hmm. uh, so that it's, it's actually the syntax is always correct yeah. every time. And, it, and, and also like if you, if you do a mistake, it doesn't matter, then you just get an error that probably says something like unknown a mm -hmm. command or you run out of memory because the memory requirement was specified incorrectly or something. Yeah. It doesn't matter that much, but uh, it's good to get that out of the way, like basically, <laughs> like just, just try it out and see how it goes. Yeah. Okay. So let's get right to it then. Mm, we prepared the HackMD with the exercise information. So see you in about half an hour. Let us know any problems via the usual way, HackMD. Bye. And we're back. Hello. I hope you all had a nice little break there. Maybe first we can quickly look and see what important questions we have from HackMD. Uh, Simo, did you see any good yeah, ones? Yeah, one, one good question. Well. The first question was that why do we have s run within the script itself? Like, what's the point? And and the point is uh, having s run within the uh, s batch script uh, is to to get like additional information uh, about what the script is doing. Uh, 
so when you have this s run statement it basically means that slurm will like record this so-called job step so it will like uh, it will record that okay like i will need information about the specific uh, specific uh, command that will be run and the specific command should get all of the resources that the that were requested by the job you can also like give it less resource if you want to but usually you you want to give the resources this is especially important when you're running mpi jobs where you need to we'll talk about it tomorrow but where you need to uh, have the slurm allocate all of the relevant uh, workers for the job but s run is usually good to to add because then you get additional information what the script is doing you don't need to preface every command with s run only those like that are the actual calculation step but then let's say you have like a complex pipeline or complex workflow where you do some pre-processing you do some simulation and then you have some post-processing maybe then if you have s run at each step you can see how long each individual step takes you can see what memory requirement was for each step you can mm-hmm. see if if it failed on a specific step like you get more better information other thing that you can uh, like the, there was a question is that uh, if you have multiple mm-hmm. s run statements i have an example of the yeah so with S run, you get these extra lines like here for echo, which shows you yeah. individual memory. So if you had multiple things running, you could better understand the behavior. Yes. Otherwise, it will just like uh, say that okay, everything was underneath the banner of the whole script, mm-hmm. like uh, like which which uh, which command actually used the resources, then yeah. it will calculate them for the script itself. Okay. Uh, the other thing uh, that was asked is that if S, if you have a S run statement, do you need to specify any other requirements for it? And usually no. Like usually S run inherits like everything inside the script inherits the requirements of the S batch statement. So if you have these S batch statements at the top, everything inside the script will have the same resources available for you. So I think those are where the most pressing questions i think okay so, so should we go to uh, the exercises then and i think simo yeah. will demonstrate so, yeah switching so to his screen okay so yeah let's go through the first exercise so we had the basic batch job exercise which was that uh let's submit that batch job that uh, run host name uh I'll call it like run hostname.sh, the script. Mm-hmm. Open with nano. And I'll first write here the bin bash. I'll use the dash L. Why not? Uh, then I'll specify the time limit. So let's say the time limit is one hour and 15 minutes. So what is the syntax here? So is it one one fifteen or one fifteen. The, well, the syntax, yeah, you can look it up. But the best syntax is to use this uh, hour, minute, second. So mm-hmm. this way you get the correct time. There's, yeah. uh, you can also specify days at the at here at the top start if you need. But usually, well, it becomes apparent when you when it's needed. But you can specify it in hours as well. And then memory limit, I use mem 500 megabytes. So you don't need to put the B at the end. Uh, I almost did it, but uh, like <laughs> yeah. the, it's it's only the uh, multipl- multiplier, so 500 megabytes. Mm-hmm. And then uh, let's add the S run hostname. We could run it without S run, but let's add uh, S run anyway. And now let's save the file and say yes and i'll uh submit it i okay. submit it i run slurm q oh it already okay. run it's done too fast and i run ls to see the output i'll catenate the output file okay so mm-hmm. it ran on pe84 so uh yeah the job name uh, now the output file was this like automatically generated slurm dash and the job id 
but maybe I don't want to like create, I want to run the script again and again. I don't want to create a different output file every time. So let's open the run hostname script. Let's add a sbatch statement called output equals, uh, let's say hostname output dot out. Like that's uh, as, as explicit as it can be. Uh, also, we wanted to actually specify the host name, and I didn't say that, so let's write it again. We put host name, say host name output dot out, and job name, I think it's written like this. Uh, I'll check for you. Yeah. Well, if it isn't, if we will get an error. Yeah. So that will give us... Um, I'll give it something different. So let's say my host name script. And now I will save it and save it. And I will run it. So let's run it. I'll try to catch it before it goes. There's this shorthand for slurm q called slurm q. Uh, easy to pronounce. And we can see that it was pending and now it's already done. And let's look at the Slurm history uh, for 10 minutes. Hmm. So here we see previously the first script we ran was run hostname.sh. And the second script, it has its custom name. So if we want to like identify mm -hmm. our jobs easier, we can use the job name to to figure out like yeah. how to uh, like if we want to make certain that we understand what we are running. So we can then look look our jobs easier in the output. Okay, so let's uh, so let, does the printed host name match? So yeah. over here we had the PE eighty four, and if we look at the output, now we see the host name output that out so maybe too redundant the naming but we can catenate it and it's p84 so okay. it's definitely run on that now yeah okay so what's next uh, submitting and canceling so let's create a script called sleep dot uh, sh or like let's say sleep job dot sh and we want the want this job to keep running so that we can we have time to actually uh, cancel it. So we first write the usual uh, litur liturgies. So let's put time. Let's put ten minutes. Memory five hundred megabytes. Let's say like that, and put sleep three hundred there. Just for variety, I won't put S run here. Mm -hmm. And let's submit the job with S batch. Okay. And now we see yeah. with Slurm Q. Okay, there it is. And let's cancel. We can take the ID over here or over here mm -hmm. and S cancel it. So Richard, when do we need to cancel our jobs? Hmm. Usually. I guess if you don't want to do it anymore, like maybe a common case is you realize you made some mistake in it. So you need to, you don't want to waste the resources or you submit a bunch of jobs and you see that the first ones are dying. Like you make a big array yeah. job and you see something's wrong in one of them. So you want to stop all of them. I guess I don't really cancel jobs that often somehow. Yeah, if you don't make mistakes, you never <laughs> have to fix them. Yeah. 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 But but it's good to keep in mind because like otherwise you might end up, especially with the interactive sessions and stuff like that, you might end up with something running. And uh, what we didn't mention that much, well, we'll mention it in a second about the priorities, but uh, we can mention it a bit later let's finish the exercises first so let's write this uh yeah so this is a script which will 
run 30 times the for i in sequence 30 and it will print the date and then sleep for 10 seconds and then repeat this 30 times. So the point here is that we're going to see the output as it's being generated. Which you often want to do, like you submit something that takes several days and you're like, okay, I really want to see what is coming out of this job live without waiting for it to finish. And this way you can do that. There was a question in the HackMD that uh, like, why does this fail? And uh, it fails because like uh, it, this, there's no such command as for, and uh, it's, it's internal to the bash itself. So you need to put S run on top of the, the command that you actually run. So let's say the date command. So let's say mm -hmm. that would be the main main thing we want to run. Uh, you want maybe to put a S run on top of that, not not to the um, yeah, not to the other ones. I'll put an S run there just for fun, so we yeah. can see what the output looks like. So let's okay. save the file. Uh, what? Oh, uh, what? Maybe I. Okay. Maybe I miss. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, okay. I, I made changed. a. Yeah, 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 okay. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll just save it and I'll move it. I'll move yeah. the file. So this is something, you, when you make a mistake like this, you can uh, you can fix it by moving the file. Yeah, so now okay. it's a renamed file. So let's submit okay. it. Okay. Yeah, so now it's so, running. So where would the output we, be? So it's running there. Uh, let's open a new terminal so we can we can see it, see it on a different terminal. So I'll mm -hmm. close this one. So my connection to Triton is closed. Mm, okay. Uh, I have this shorthand that makes it my connection to Triton a bit easier because I make yeah. maybe hundred connections per day. <laughs> so I yeah. have all of these shorthands. Uh, don't worry about them. Okay. Uh, so you're going back to the same place you were before. Yeah, like yeah. My, so this is a very important demonstration. You can log out and log in again, and it's still going. Yeah. So okay, so let's here look we are. at the what the queue is running. It's still okay. running there. So yeah. I could be sleep. I could be working on other stuff. It's mm -hmm. still running there. So let's look at the output. So let's use, for example, less to to see the output. So it's the job ID is that. So we didn't specify output file. So file three one. There okay. is it running. Do you want to tail it? Yeah. So, so what is tail? So we, if we specify this tail, does uh, if we follow the file, basically we we follow the, okay. uh, the file output. So if you have something that prints uh, output, you can follow the output and see how it behaves. Uh, usually, like in best case scenarios, you don't need to do this, but if you need to see what happens, then this is one way of doing it. So there it's running happily. And let's uh, cancel it. Okay. And let's look at the output uh, of the Slurm history. Uh, so we see here, the hmm. this is the the sleep uh, yeah. okay. the job, sleep. and because we had the S run statement to the next to the de, uh, date statement, we get e job step for each. So uh, every date has its own yeah. thing there. Mm -hmm. So let's say it, instead of date, we would have something that runs a simulate or analysis that takes an hour. We could see output for every simulation step. This is especially important when you have something that you, you have like a bias in process or something that you don't know when it's going to end. So you can like check how different uh, yeah. variables may be, maybe how long did they take. Hmm. So you might want to do something like this. Yeah. Okay, the advanced okay. stuff, we can probably skip those. Yeah, we you can comment in can go MD. forward. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we so, left ourselves a bit of slack at the end of the day because we wanted to have enough time for everything, and it's going to be uh, helpful, I think, at this point. Yeah. 